Our gospel scripture message this morning, passage comes this morning from the 13th chapter of Luke, verses 7 through 14. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them in a parable, when you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brother or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This Lenten season, we are preaching from the Bible study, Meeting Jesus at the Table. On the first Sunday of Lent, although I wasn't here, I was worshiping with you online. Pastor Lowe shared a story of his favorite holiday. He said that it was the 4th of July, and he said that inevitably his Uncle Ricky would show up uninvited at the picnic extravaganza. And though uninvited, he said, his mother always believed that everyone needed a place where they belonged. And so Uncle Ricky was welcome to be there as well. Last Sunday, Pastor BJ shared the story of his neighbor who would show up uninvited at their door, in the backyard, on their sofa, interrupting, interrupting their gathering so frequently that he became a part of the family. So as I prepared to preach this morning, I realized that I, and I suspect that each of you, have memories of making room at a table breaking bread and eating with others who were invited, or maybe not. The story of making room at the table that came flooding back to me occurred summer after summer during my childhood. It was not unusual for a revival to be scheduled in the Baptist church during the summer months, and an out-of-town guest preacher would be invited to preach that week. And often, members would be asked to prepare and host the pastor for one evening during dinner. Now, my mother was an amazing cook. And the guest preacher would often be invited to our home for dinner. My mother would go above and beyond preparing a meal, enlisting my help. You know, she would let me peel the potatoes or pick or chop vegetables. Sometimes she'd have me at the stove stirring a sauce or measuring an ingredient while she worked on another dish. Usually a couple of hours before the worship service, our pastor and the guest pastor would appear at our door along with their wives, some of the church deacons and other friends who had been invited. I remember that during those meals, my brother and I and other children would eat in the kitchen while all the adults would eat in the dining room or at a table my mom would set up in the living room or the breezeway because there were so many adults that were there. That was the summer version of the Thanksgiving children's table. Now, even though, even though my family, in my family, children were always seated at the table with the rest of the family on Thanksgiving and other holidays. The Gospel of Luke is replete with stories of Jesus dining in people's homes. Commentator Fred Craddock writes, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. For Judaism, he writes, for Jesus and for the early church, table fellowship was laden with significant meanings, religious, social, and economic. 
Credit continues that nothing can be for Luke more serious than a dining table. Both the Eucharist and revelations of the, of the risen Christ occurred there. Christ gave his disciples the promise of the Holy Ghost there. Holy Spirit. I went back to my Baptist roots there for a minute. <laughs> and their commission. And it was by table fellowship that Jews and Gentiles could be the church. Now, even though Jesus ate with tax collectors, sinners, audacious women, and other marginalized people, in today's passage, he is invited to share a Sabbath meal in the home of a Pharisee. Yes, a member of the legalistic religious sect that continually questioned, discredited, and accused Jesus of breaking religious conventions and practices, including healing on the Sabbath. You see, a few verses before today's pericope, Jesus at the table confirmed that the Sabbath was made for humanity as a time to rest, reflect, and be restored, that humanity was not made for the Sabbath. Therefore, healing, caring for, and ministering to people in need was appropriate, even on the Sabbath. Now, while sitting at the Pharisees' table, Jesus upset religious conventions and practices when he laid hands on a man who was, healed, was ill and healed the swelling in his extremities. Now, after healing the man, Jesus noticed that some of the guests were competing and trying to um, sit at a place of honor at the table. In Jesus' day, male guests, you got that, male guests, not women or children, would recline on couches to eat, and the honored guest, men with the greatest wealth, power, or station in life, would be seated in the center. In the book, Meeting Jesus at the Table, Christine Campbell writes, it would not have been uncommon for the seating to continually be changing as more prestigious men came in, requiring the lower ranking guests to move down to a location further from the guest of honor. End of quote. And it was in this social and religious context that Jesus spoke this parable. Now this parable was not spoken to remind the guests of traditional table manners. Jesus shared this parable to remind the guests that in the economy of God, conventions and practices of exclusion and hierarchy are not only passe, but the rules of engagement are entirely rewritten. In the economy of God, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Little children shall lead. The excluded, the marginalized, the oppressed, the devalued, and the despised all have a seat of honor at table. Jesus extorted, when someone invites you to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. Go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Jesus did not share a lesson in proper etiquette or appropriate table manners. According to Craddock, Jesus's, Jesus shared kingdom talk when he said, everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, unless we get it twisted, this is not an invitation for us to feign humanity, for us to pretend that we are humble, taking a lesser position in anticipation of or believing that by doing so, we will be exalted. This is an invitation to empty and humble ourselves of our pretense, of our self-importance, our self-centeredness, our self-absorption, or our egocentricity. If Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard it, equality with God as something to be ex extorted, but emptied and humbled himself and died on the cross for our sins. If Jesus, the sovereign God, did not succumb to the accuser's temptations while in the wilderness for 40 days, who are we to not be content with just being invited to occupy any seat at the table? Jesus is not finished with his kingdom talk. He turns to address the evening's dinner host, and he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brother or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and then you would be repaid. 
But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. The language used by Luke to describe people who are impaired is not acceptable in our context. And to imply that an impairment would prevent someone from fully participating in, a, in society is offensive to us. However, Jesus was describing people who, in his context, were considered outcast, untouchable, less than by society, excluded and banished. Now, lest we think that we're exempt or have evolved from thinking this way and treating others this way, there are times when we turn our proverbial noses up at people living in poverty, homelessness, with mental, physical, or spiritual illness, and other impairments that we either fear, do not understand, or just simply want to ignore. These are exactly the people that Jesus said we should be inviting to sit at table and to share a meal. People who have nothing to give us in return. People who do not have the means or ability to engage in a reciprocal or transactional relationship with us. Campbell writes, Jesus' parable of the dinner party raises the dangers, dangers of transactional relationships that are based in quid pro quo, something for something, and that obscure our best efforts at real hospitality. Jesus tells his Pharisaic host, we are capable of so much more. Jesus' instructions move us from transactional to transformational relationships. Re relationships that move from survival-based, get-what-I-can relationships to reign-of-God relationships, where tables are flipped and doors are open, the leaves of the table come out, and bread is broken together with all of God's children. Now, this really isn't a lesson about where people are seated at the table. This is a lesson about who is welcomed to a seat at the table. This lesson applies to all the places where we work, recreate, where we are educated, and especially in our place of worship. EOPC, I invite you to look around. Look around you. Who is missing in this worship service and why? Campbell continues, Christ's table invites us to pay attention to who has a place at the table and what drives that seating arrangement. Is it power, influence, privilege, or lack of trust? Or is it world-changing, love-lifting, transformational trust? Beloved, are we so comfortable or complacent that we have forgotten Jesus' command to go out into the highways and the byways and implore them to come? Are we so comfortable and complacent that we have forgotten our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and radical hospitality? Are we so comfortable and complacent inside the church walls that we can ignore people who may never enter the building? Are we so comfortable and complacent that we have unconsciously relegated some to sit on the margins as far away from as, us as possible so that we do not have any responsibility to invite them in or better yet, to go out to them? As a child eating in the kitchen when guest preachers dined at my home, I never felt excluded or relegated to a lesser place. My mother always made sure that we were valued and loved. She would replicate the same table setting for the children in the kitchen. We had our own chinaware and drinkware and napkins and serving bowls just like the adults. My mother made sure that we felt as special as our guest, and she would often prepare a special treat just for the children. As we prepare to gather at table this morning, remember that Christ invites us to trust in God who welcomes everyone, 
a God who throws open the doors that all may enter in and makes room at a table where there is always more than enough. God's provision will never be depleted. God's hospitality is infinite. God's grace overturns worldly traditions, dictates, and exclusions. God is a disruptor of proper table manners. Hallelujah. And established a new world order where social graces are not the order of the day. So take a seat. Don't worry about the proper placement of your elbows. Don't worry about what you have on. And don't worry about your proximity to the guest of honor. The only necessary table manners that are needed are acceptance, humility, generosity, hospitality, and love. Unconditional, unadulterated, love. So let us prepare to break bread together. Amen.